Um, I'm thrilled to welcome you to this new venue. Uh, fantastic views over the city of London uh, and for what I know uh, will be a fabulous conference today. Uh, thank you all very much for making the new journey to, uh, to this location. Uh, now, uh, we have amongst us uh, many distinguished guests today, uh, some of whom I will uh, introduce a little later. Uh, but I want to start by recognizing uh, CBI's former president, Dame Helen Alexander, who died earlier this year. Uh, a fantastic chief executive of The Economist, a tremendous advocate for business, uh, and an absolutely unique woman. She was always in her element at these conferences. Uh, we all miss her, and our thoughts are with Tim and her family. Uh, the event today has required many, many contributions, but particularly important is the partnership with Accenture and Hayes, and I'd like to thank both of them for their support. Now, 15 years ago, uh, Teach First was launched just across the river in Canary Wharf. Since that time, London has gone from the worst place in the UK for children from challenging backgrounds to be educated to the best. Teach First has worked in every region in England and Wales, trained over 10,000 teachers, and changed the lives of over one million children. How have they been successful? By taking other people with them, graduates, universities, the schools themselves, and of course, business. UK firms are crying out for well-qualified people with employability skills. So Teach First got the businesses to contribute their expertise, advice, and much of the cash they needed to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, British industry has never been more keen to prove its worth to society than it is today. And I know it's not a numbers game, but that doesn't mean that numbers aren't impressive. Three quarters of all UK tax revenue, 500 billion sterling, is supported by private sector activities through the taxes they pay, the jobs they create, and the products that they make. The private sector employs almost 27 million people, over 83% of all employment. Business has invested billions into UK infrastructure. The energy sector invested 11.9 billion last year. Airport operates alone will invest over 8 billion by 2022. And for rail operators, it's at least 11.6 billion by 2027. And we're fantastic at turning our heritage of diplomacy and innovation into international trade such as our over $1 trillion trading and investment relationship with the USA split about 50-50, or our $2 trillion trading and re investment relationship with the EU. Our status as the largest G20 investor and job creator in India, or even our approach in China, where we've been the first to shift our investments into high growth regions and sectors. The entire nation can feel proud of this. We can feel ownership, we can feel achievement, we can feel fulfillment. We can feel all of these. But we cannot feel complacent. Because in 40 years in business, I have never known a commercial environment so rich in opportunity, yet so mired in threat. On the one hand, the fourth industrial revolution a big bang of automation and AI that would create massive new trading opportunities. But on the other, a system of capitalism that seems to have forgotten its purpose, and a Brexit that threatens to overshadow national decision-making at the very moment when clarity and decisiveness is more important than ever. These two issues and how to overcome them are what I want to talk about today, beginning with capitalism. Now, capitalism has driven the biggest and most sustainable increase in health and wealth that the world has ever known. Since 2000, global life expectancy has risen by five years. 300,000 people daily gain access to electricity, and a quarter of a million people every day escape
poverty. These are fantastic stats. We should be proud of them, but we should also listen when people's own experiences are less positive. UK household wealth stands at over 11 trillion, yet 15% of adults either have no share of it or are in debt. Until everybody feels the benefits of capitalism in their pockets and in their homes, we will have a problem. No PR in the world can fix this. It has to be action, collective action for shared challenges. But here's the good news. History shows us that we can turn things around, just as Carnegie and Ford did a century ago, just as British industrialists like Cadbury and the Lever Brothers did with their model villages, just as the British people embraced the competitive market in the 1980s. We can do the same and once again unite the country behind inclusive capitalism, more equal growth and a sustainable, resilient economy. Here's what we need to do. First and foremost, we need to eat, drink and sleep productivity. Data from the ONS shows that Britain's output per hour is now 22% lower than the USA, around 27% lower than Germany. With those figures, it no longer seems unfortunate that Germany has grown its exports twice as fast as us in the past five years. It seems inevitable. As a CBI report identified last year, to close the gap, we need to invest in infrastructure, invest in education, and invest in management skills. This will take time, but it's possible. For example, about 60% of young Germans participate in vocational training programs. We can't conjure up that change out of thin air, but we can do more to catch up. The apprenticeship levy can help us to do that, but only if it's made more flexible and responsive. And at the same time, we have to invest in our schools by protecting per pupil funding and replenishing capital budgets and making sure that young people have the skills, the experience and the career guidance they need to succeed and that they deserve. But we can also prepare ahead of time for the fact that many jobs in the future will be automated, over 35% according to some studies. This has huge workplace implications, but it also has implications for inequality. The low-skilled jobs that disappear will be replaced by high-skilled jobs responsible for oversight and management. This is more than a step change. It's a completely new era, one that will require a massive program of education and training. So business, government, and unions must work together and make sure that our economy and our employees are able to adapt. Elsewhere, we need to think about regional growth. The new metro mayors are a fabulous start. Andy Street in the West Midlands, Andy Burnham in Manchester, and the great Ben Houchen in the Tees Valley. Now, I remember arriving at Teesside when I was 21. I ended up staying for a decade. Fantastic place. And when people say to me, Paul, why are you so optimistic? I say, you try supporting Middlesbrough Football Club for 10 years and see what happens to you. Teesside is a very different place today, but they're still pioneering great ways to remain competitive. Teesside University has created a new range of STEM apprenticeships in areas critical to the local economy, engineering, digital skills, and logistics. They've attracted £250,000 funding from the higher education regulator by getting local businesses, local government, and students to thrash out a plan of action together. Similar schemes exist across the country, but not nearly enough. Business and education must overlap as a matter of course, not as an optional extra. We know what happens when we get this right. A more inclusive economy, one that grows consistently, and one that is not only resilient to change, but that powers it in the first place. So sustainable growth will only happen if business plays its part. But business has another responsibility, a central clause in our social covenant. We have the responsibility 
to speak up and to suggest solutions when we see obstacles in the way of UK prosperity. And currently, we see one major challenge. Not Brexit itself. We're 100% committed to making a success of it. But the approach to Brexit. We need a single, clear strategy and plan. A plan for what we want and what kind of relationship we seek with the EU. But at the moment, I am reminded of a primetime soap opera with a different episode each week. First Lancaster House, then Article 50, then a European Council, two, two dinners with Juncker, and no doubt many instalments to follow. Each one becomes the big story until the next one rolls around. And the effect is that genuine and important steps forward, such as the Prime Minister's Florence speech, don't get the recognition they deserve. That speech represented real progress. It put the needs of the economy first. It set a cooperative and friendly tone. And it unlocked progress. We need to learn from that and recognize that this is the moment to unite behind the principles of the Florence speech so it becomes the Florence Treaty. But time is of the essence. We must leave behind this episodic approach and take this opportunity to move forward as one. Business, politicians, here and abroad, everyone in this room. According to a new CBI survey, 87% of companies have discussed Brexit at board level. If anything, that's too low. So the other 13% need to get a crack on and get on with it. As you'd expect, our largest and best resourced companies lead the way on contingency planning, financial services, tech, logistics. But for SMEs, the powerhouses of the UK economy, things are taking longer. They tell us they're struggling, struggling to plan, to predict, to calculate. To those companies, I say this, the CBI will do everything it possibly can to support you. But to Whitehall and to Brussels, the Bundestag and the Assembly Nationale, I say this, now more than ever, business is looking for political leaders right across Europe to step up. Brexit is only 508 days away, but for many businesses, their alarm clocks are set earlier than that. They've set to the moment where they'll actually enact their contingency plans. For 10% of businesses, that alarm has already rung and they're beginning to move their staff, slowing the recruitment, investing elsewhere. Without a transition deal, when EU leaders gather in Brussels for the March summit, a total of 60% of businesses will have done the same. The clock is ticking. So government and the EU need to get a move on. Making progress, remaining flexible, being pragmatic, and first of all, sorting out with clarity details on transitional arrangements. These arrangements won't solve everything. But 75% of the country's largest firms say that clarity on transition would halt their preparations for no deal. And then banking on that short-term stability, we can turn to the biggest prize of all, the long-term relationship between the UK and the EU, based on a trade deal for goods and services that's right for the people of Britain. But this will never happen while the EU 27 is more united than the UK 1. We will never secure that deal if the successors to Churchill and Attlee don't own the moment and come together in the national interest. Every business here today knows this. We all have our cabinets of sorts. <coughs> there are boards, and every one of them has diversity of opinions, even the successful ones, especially the successful ones. But the difference is this. Success comes from developing these different views into a shared vision and common goals. The same is true wherever you look. Teamwork pays dividends. 
33 of the last 40 Nobel Prize winners in science and economics have gone to teams. The most rapidly improving schools are praised for the cohesion of their leadership teams. Now, I know Brexit is a huge issue, but our parliament does have a proud history of meeting unprecedented challenge with unprecedented cooperation. In the 30s, after the Great Depression, during World War II, under the great unifier, Winston Churchill. We need that spirit again, and we need it now. Just think what we could do if we get it right. A constructive and collaborative approach to Brexit would reassure millions of EU nationals in the UK and tell them, yes, we do want you to carry on contributing to our society. It would make free trade deals quicker and easier to accomplish, and it would project an image of a strong, self-confident nation across the world. But most of all, it would be a principled way to get the deal that we want and that Europe wants. A good deal and a deal that allows businesses to grow, to import and export easily. A deal that keeps our R&D structures intact for new work into robotics and AI. And a deal that protects jobs, people's ability to travel and their freedom to choose the life they lead. <coughs> In other words, a good deal would secure our prosperity for future generations. The Prime Minister was spot on when she described the free market as the greatest agent of collective human progress ever created. There is no better system for creating hope and opportunity, but it won't fall in our laps. We do need politics united. We need business united, and we need Britain united. That's the only way to get the Brexit we need, the economy we deserve, and prosperity for all. Thank you very much, and have a wonderful conference.